and we were very apologetic about that. But however, however my name is Kevin Crum. I'm actually the uh, the lead of the HBCU LLR uh, subcommittee, at the subcommittee, and I share this platform with Ms. Tori Clark. Uh, right now, we're going to go through our expert panelists and introduce you to each one. Our first panelist is, her name is Katie York. Uh, she joined the NCAA in 2002, and Katie is a social director and ac ac academic and members of affairs. Uh, she pr primarily works with Division I academics and has extensive experience with the uh, APP, including data collection, uh, penalties, and loss of access to postseason competition. Uh, also, she served as a she serves on the incident with Division I liaison committee as academic submitting sub data, which she will talk about later. Uh, she has experience with uh, bylaws of 14 uh, internship progress towards degree waivers, uh, the 44 transfer waiver. Uh, and also, like today, she'll be talking about the acceleration academic uh, success program. Uh, before joining the NCAA, she served as Stinks in athletic compliance at Southwest Texas uh, State University, now Texas State, and Baylor University. Uh, she always worked. She also worked with the Salt Lake Organization Committee for the 2002 Winter Olympics. Uh, she received an undergrad degree from journalism from Louisville State, Louisiana State University, and her MBA in sports management concentration from Robert Morris University. And I'm going to let Miss Tori Clark introduce Miss Jennifer Williams, as Tori had the opportunity to work under Miss Williams. Oh, I don't think we can hear you, Tori. We can't hear you. I would introduce Ms. Jennifer uh, just to keep it going. Uh, currently, Ms. Jennifer Williams is with the uh, USA, uh, USA Basketball uh, as the Chief Development Officer. Uh, she actually serves a stint as the Athletic Director uh, at Alabama State University. Uh, she, earns her, she earns her bachelor's from North Carolina, North, make sure I get this right, North Carolina University, at where she played basketball at. And also, she received her her master from the Carolina A and T State University, uh, but we will we will let us discuss herself later on, later on in the, in the panel. Move on to the next. The next individual is Mr. France Williams. Uh, he's a mission forward leader with ten years experience in nonprofit higher education development. Uh, he's a proven he has approved relationships. Builder who combines intelligent, curiosity, strong analysts, and interpersonal skills to advance mission equity and philanthropy support. Currently, he serves as a director of development for Breakthrough Miami, which uses a unique student teach, teaching and student model to create a vibrant learning community for underrepresented five through 12 grade students to achieve success. Uh, and our first student athlete uh, from Lincoln University is Ms. Millette. Uh, she is majoring in cyber cybersecurity with a minor in black studies in her off season from so softball. She also holds a head manager position for the football program. Additionally, Ms. Millette serves as a student athlete advisor committee. Our next student athlete representing the SWAC from Mississippi Valley State. Ms. Jewel, uh, she's from she's from California. She is the third oldest of nine siblings. She created her success and support in softball to her mother who introduced her to the sport at the age of nine. Along with being an outstanding student athlete, Ju also served as a student worker in the Harris Complex on campus 
and was a Spring 21, aka Incorporated Jewel maintained a 4.0 GPA through her undergrad studies uh, from Mississippi Valley State University. Uh, she is currently pursuing her master's degree in business administration and serving as a graduate assistant coach for, for softball. Our next individual is Miss Monte, Monte Brown, which she plays for my former, uh, actually my former boss, athletic director Kevin Harrell. Uh, Monte, Monte Brown is a senior at Tyde College. She's on the women's basketball team, majoring in biology. Uh, Monte's goal after graduation is to become a nice practitioner by earning her PhD in orthodontics. Our next individual is Jaquan Lawrence from Chicago, Illinois. Jaquan is a senior on the men's basketball team at the Moon College major in information technology. After graduating, Jaquan looks to enter the field of technology, especially working in coding. I can hear you. Okay, my apologies. I was gonna start with the first question, sorry about that. Uh, can you explain your position with the NCAA? I am an associate director in academic and membership affairs, and I serve on as a staff liaison to the AASP selection committee. So that is the committee that's established with the division one membership um, representation to choose who, uh, which institutions um, will be chosen to award the AASP grants to. Um, as you mentioned in my intro, I work almost exclusively in Division I academics with the NCAA. I have a role with the, within the Committee on Academics supporting the Subcommittee on Data, which is the group that oversees all of the APR components. Um, but I also work with progress toward degree legislation, interpretations, um, and things like that. Can you explain your role and duties as a staff lies on to the NCAA ACC Selection Committee? Um, as with almost everything within the NCAA structure, we have to conduct our work through committee representation from the membership. So we have a group of people who've been selected to serve as the um, folks who choose who receives the, way, the grants. And then also if there are questions about how they should be executed, if there are changes that have to be made in the financing, um, the way the institution wants to spend the money, that group has to review all of that. And I serve as a liaison to them. So I help prepare materials for them. I um, get questions to them from the membership uh, as needed. Um, and you know, also coordinate the collection of all the grant applications, put them together for them to review, that sort of thing. Can you explain the, the Federation Academic Success Program Initiative grant application process? Yep, it's conducted um, on an annual basis. The application process is accessed through Program Hub, which is a, a, an app within the NCAA.org website. Um, it's fairly straightforward. Um, it's a series of questions that have to be answered. Um, some information about the institution, the way its academic support is organized, and then what, how much money they are requesting, and then what they intend to do with those dollars and how they will manage those dollars. Um, the application is set to open, uh, I'm hoping by Monday, we had a little IT glitch, um, but usually it does open in February and then it will close on April 15th. Um, it is this year just a request for single year grants. That's what we did last year as well. Um, there is hope that we will go back to the multi-year grants, but that has not, uh, that decision has not been made yet. So we are again, like I said, operating with requests for a single year grant. There is a set limit on how many times an institution can actually apply for a grant. There's no limit on how many times an institution can apply. Um, obviously, they can apply any time they feel that they have some initiatives that that would benefit from this type of funding. Um, and there's not a there's not a written statement on how many times they can be awarded the grant. The committee has to look at the entirety of the grant application pool, and then they make their um, their call on on which uh, institutions should be given um, that grant in that particular year. So it, it's really a case by case review. Um, how, how has the program helped or hindered uh, the applicants that apply? Um, to, in, in my mind, they, it has been really helpful. Um, the requirement is that the dollars have to be used for academic support initiatives. So that can be anything from renovating a, a study area to um, possibly purchasing technology that would be assistem, assisting uh, student athletes, maybe um, you know, laptops, computers, or iPads, or something like that that they could use 
when they're traveling. We've seen institutions use the dollars for mobile hotspots. We've seen it used for access to tutoring services. It, 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 I think it has helped every institution that has um, received one. Um, I, I, I don't think there's any scenario where it has hindered the institution. Uh, it just, the main thing is the institution has to kind of do that self-analysis and figure out what do, does it need and um, what's the best way to, to go forward with that need and, and potentially using grant dollars to, to achieve that. As the African demographic change that the program birth for is like, you know, PWIs, predominantly white institution, HBCUs, or even Hispanic service institution, have you saw a change over the years? Um, no, the the requirement is that the institution has to be classified as what is what we refer to as AASP eligible, but typically that is an institution in the bottom resources, bottom 15% of resources, and it cannot be an FBS institution. Those institutions cannot apply for the grant. Um, the only so the demographic of the institutions has not changed. Um, obviously, sometimes we get a new member, and so the, the category that that new member might fall into that lower demographic. So we might have a new school that can apply this year that maybe wasn't part of the group in a previous year. Um, but no, it's it's been since its inception, it's been designed for specifically um, institutions that are classified as having lower resources than than other institutions within the division. Are there any do's or don'ts not to do an application process? Um, as I said, the application is pretty straightforward. Um, I don't, I don't, I mean, the, the main things are the institution needs to present um, a clear plat path for how they want to use these dollars. Um, we would expect that the institution, if they're saying they would like to do, you know, a technology pur purchase, we would expect that you have already sourced that the, that technology, you know how much that technology is going to cost. So if, for example, they're saying it's going to cost us uh, $20,000 to make this purchase of some new um, laptops, we expect that you've already, you haven't bought them, obviously, because you don't have the dollars, but you've already contacted a, a supplier and you have a, a quote um, so that it's very specific. Um, I, I think the other thing is that there is a requirement that there be a statement from the institution's president. And I think that is very helpful to the committee to get a sense that, that the president or chancellor, whoever the, the CEO is of the institution can provide a statement that just confirms how the dollars are gonna be used and how the dollars will benefit um, student athletes. It also is helpful to have a sense of, is there a way that you can do um, uh, an assessment to, to demonstrate impact? Um, you know, even if it's as simple as saying, you know, we had, we had no hotspots, we had no ability for student athletes to access internet when they were traveling, and now we have 10 of them. So we know we've increased that, uh, that access opportunity very um, significantly. I mean, just things like that where the institution, because they have to write a final report at the end and just kind of an ability to say, yes, we did see an impact. Sometimes it takes time for these impacts to really happen, and the committee is very sensitive to that. But it is helpful to, to have a, a clear sense of, of what the institution wants to do and how they're anticipating um, these dollars to impact their, their um, operation. Thank you, Ms. Jordan. I, once again, I apologize to everybody for the, the technology uh, issues, but I uh, really appreciate everybody coming on board. I will turn it over to our colleague, Ms. Tori Clark. She will actually ask Ms. Williams the upcoming questions. All right, as y'all know, I am back again. He's passing off the mic to me so smooth. I appreciate it. Uh, just before we start, Jen, you already know, A.D. Williams, it's a pleasure to be back in your space. Um, I am honored. <laughs> but our first question will definitely be, uh, what are the main key aspects of a successful fundraising campaign? And you can either speak to being in the space that you are now or speaking to, you know, being a former A.D. Uh, yeah, thank you, Tori. And first of all, thank you to the group for having me. Um, anytime we can talk about fundraising and how we can get more people of color um, aware of what it is to work in development, because we don't have a lot of folks in this space. And there is an opportunity for people of color, especially women of color, to be impactful in this role. So um, then I also want to clear, I went to North Carolina Central for grad school. a and is the rival. I did work there. And I am a former student athlete. I played basketball at the University of North Carolina. So I had to clear that up because there's some Eagles on the call. I don't want them going back saying I said I went to a &T. So, okay. 
So um, about a successful fundraising campaign, um, it starts with having a clear cut clear, I can't talk, clear cut plan. So you have to make sure you have um, an idea of what you're obviously want to fundraise for. You want to have your goal in mind. You want to be able to articulate that. Also, who are your demographic that you're going to tap into? Um, at a lot of colleges, I'm going to speak to the collegiate level because that's the majority of you all on this um, Zoom. You want to make sure that you have a stable and formal giving unit in place within your athletic department before you start and dive into a campaign. Um, you cannot go into a campaign if you don't have a booster club or a giving arm established in your department or if you're not working directly with the folks on the university side and in institutional advancement. So to me, that's step number one is having a platform that you're able to give. Then making sure you have that plan. Um, I believe in communicating. So once you determine who your donor base, who you're going to target, who your prospects are, you need to be able to articulate what your goal is. So if you know that you received the AASP grant, but it's on your end to raise, let's say, $80,000 to fulfill that commitment, then you need to articulate that and state that in your communications to um, your constituents. So whether it's um, electronic communication, if you're meeting with a prospect one-on-one -on -one or a corporation that may want to make a corporate donation, you need to be able to clearly define what it is that you're try trying to achieve. And then the why. You want to pull on people's heartstrings. You want them to know why it's impactful for them to give you money. Um, we're come. We're still in COVID. I don't want to say we're come. We're still in COVID. So people, um, you know, they 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 are being a little tight with maybe how they give their money. So they want to. Need, they need to know the impact that it's going to have. And anytime you're talking about student athletes and student athlete success and academic success, to me, those are easy sales, and people will jump on board to support. Um, helping student athletes, students be successful because at the end of the day, while we want to win championships, we want to have success in our sport. It's about what you do to progress once you graduate from your respective institution. Lovely, lovely. I love the fact that you said it like that because I do think that sometimes we think that development, raising money, anytime, anytime, like especially let's go back to elementary school anytime you heard the word the term fundraising it was just like oh no like we got to go talk to people we got to go try to get money but honestly making that genuine connection and, and understanding the why is like as far as what these dollars are just doing like it's not just money it is just a gateway to give access to people who don't have it at that exactly time. and it's really about you know telling the narrative you know mm -hmm. really having the story in place and being able to articulate that to um, your prospects, to your donor base, because you want people to understand what they're getting behind and what they're supporting. And to me, the best people to tell that story are the student athletes. Um, while we were at Alabama State, we tried to use um, you know, our student athletes, their stories to help us push some of our fundraising efforts. So you know, talking to our academic staff, I see Ms. Brown is on here and um, Ms. Taylor is on here, some of our former academic staff folks. You know, Talking to them about student athletes who may have impactful stories that they could share to help us really push our narrative to play on the heartstrings of some of our prospects. Um, you know, we had a, a fellow, uh, Ezra Gray. I mean, uh, I think a three-time academic All-American. I mean, he had every academic accolade you could think of. So talking to our donors about him and how he's been able to have success because of this AASP grant and some of the things that we've done to help build our academic support staff at Alabama State. Those are the stories you want to try to tell It's those success stories. And um, I think at a lot of HBCUs, we have to do a better job of telling that message. Like you said, Tori, I think we tend to get be frightful when it, we talk about asking people for money, but we ask for things every day. And to me, all you, if some uh, people, all you can do is say no. I tell people, shoot your shot. You know, all you can do is say no at the end of the day. And um, I'm okay with a couple of no's, but if I get seven yeses and they're like major gifts, we're gonna be okay. So, um, you know, definitely don't be afraid to ask. Um, and as a student athlete, be open to sharing your story. If you have a success story that you think that can push the needle 
talk to your academic advisor, talk to your sports information director, talk to your sport administrator, and even talk to your AD so that they can be able to use those messaging messages when they're going out to raise money. Oh, lovely. And that is a, a beautiful, beautiful segue into our, our next question, which is, as a former HBCU athletic director, what departments would you collaborate with to meet the NCAA AASP uh, financial matching requirement? Yes. Yeah, so outside of, you know, our unit, um, definitely working with um, your facilities folks. Um, you know, some of you all may chuckle who worked with me, we, we had some challenges in that area, but, you know, again, it's about teamwork and it's about, um, you know, letting everyone understand what the goals is. And I think having those conversations up front, once you decide to apply for the grant, that helps get everyone on board so that they're not caught off guard, like, oh my gosh, we have this big commitment from an in-kind standpoint, but they know you have them walking it through the process with you. So facilities, obviously working with our faculty athletic rep, um, even though she reported to the president, I felt she was a part of our staff. So, um, but that is an outside, you know, person that we work heavily with, with our um, grant. And, um, you know, obviously, you know, making sure our business office, our business and finance unit, our CFO was aware of what was coming down the pipeline. Um, you know, didn't want any surprises there. We are limited resource institutions, but they also have to be aware of the expectation of that match. And, you know, if your fundraising campaign does fall short, that they still need to be able to accommodate, you know, fulfilling that request. All right, so what you're saying is it's not a one man show, it's a whole team effort. I, I, I appreciate that. <laughs> Because I'm definitely, definitely seeing, I'm not like, I was, of course, as an Alabama State and understanding how the grant worked, but I didn't realize that there were a lot of people that were involved. So it, I guess what I'm trying to say is I feel like that's great uh, because I believe it takes a lot more of the pressure off of that one person to kind of make this thing work when you actually, you know, delegate the work and make sure that, you know, the whole team understands what's going on. It's definitely a group, um, a, a group to me, I say project. It's a lot of collaboration. I mean, we had meetings with, you know, it was definitely, um, you know, Miss Brown was heavily involved, our FAR, our SWA, um, you know, I would come in the fold. I wasn't at every meeting, but I was there, you know, leading kind of the, the goal, giving the vision to my executive team, but it was those kind of core people really working on this grant to make it come together. And then we're talking to the president. You know, I was the liaison there, making sure our president understood and, and could articulate it to, you know, whether it was the board or anyone else about kind of the why this is so important and the impact that it would have on our student athletes. That makes that makes a lot of sense. And especially with um, you saying that there are, you know, a, a, f a few hands on deck. So with that, are there any challenges uh, to prepare, you know, to prepare the institution or the cohort for uh, applying for this grant um, or definitely meeting some of the requirements? Are, are there any challenges with, uh, with those? I mean, I, I think in terms of knowing what you need in your department, that to me is pretty cut and dry. Um, I think again, it comes with, because it is such a collaborative effort, that to me is where the challenges kind of arise because not everyone understands our sense of urgency. And when I say our athletics in getting certain things done and the timeline, because you do have the NCAA coming on campus to make sure that you're using the funds the way you say that you're going to use the funds and they want to see and hear from the student athletes and make sure what you articulated in your plan has been, um, has been, it's come to fruition, it's been done. And so making sure outside folks, you know, understand the urgency, to me, that was kind of the challenge. Um, you know, while funding was there, I think sometimes people tend to get caught up in their silo. And if it's not necessarily defect, affecting their day to day, they may kind of put it on the back burner um, where we have been communicating saying, hey, here's some deadlines. Again, things come up. So really making sure you stay on the folks um, from the facility standpoint, because while Kavisi and myself, our faculty athletic rep can write the plan, we are not going to go in and start slacking stone and putting up boards. I mean, we could, but that is not our area of expertise. So we really have to uh, rely on, you know, other folks to kind of get that job done. And so that to me is where we saw some of the challenges, but at the end, you know, ninth hour, 
it comes together. And, um, you know, we, we definitely had a successful campus visit and, um, you know, everything came together for the greater good. So um, those were the only challenges that I saw. Um, it may have been more. You guys could have kept it away from me, uh, the AD, but uh, that was what I saw. All right. Well, thank you so much for being open and honest about, you know, your journey, especially with this grant and just development as a whole. We really do appreciate it. Um, but at this time, I am going to kick it back to Kevin uh, and he will introduce our last, uh, you know, uh, expert panelist. Right. So I actually met Mr. Front maybe a month or two, maybe three months ago. And I was trying to learn more for de development for me and fundraising because this, this was a reason why I actually wanted to establish this panel because I know if I didn't know, you know, being on this level, I, I would wish would have known about this when I was an undergrad. Uh, so, with that being said, Mr. Williams, can you can you explain to me like what experience influenced you to enter this field? Yes, and and I was taking notes as Jennifer was talking. Um, you know, there's there's never a time where you you stop learning, uh, particularly in development. Um, but everyone, my name is Franz Williams. I'm a development director for Breakthrough Miami. I've been in the field for about ten years now. Um, and great question, Kevin. I fell into it. Quite honestly, um, when I went to college, I wasn't aware of development or fundraising, at least in the professional capacity. I had always associated it with um, me being a, a young boy, working with my family, and we would help out right in the community. Um, and that went from as simple as, hey, your neighbor needs a cup of sugar, to um, somebody maybe needing a place to sleep, something to eat. But from that, it really kind of, you know, in my teenage and, and high school years um, was me being volunteer centered. And then finally, after college, um, I asked somebody for a cup of coffee. And that person shared with me their role in development, their role in fundraising. And as soon as I heard a little bit about it, um, I applied for an internship. And as they say, the rest is history. Uh, now about 10 plus years in the field. Put my mic on. Uh, can you actually explain to us what is the case, the Council for Advancement of Supports Education? And can you offer some current, some current, you know, suggestions for our students when they sure. enter the profession? My pleasure, my pleasure. So, you know, one thing, and this is from my first firsthand experience. Um, again, thinking maybe this nonprofit fundraising was more like charity. In fact, this is a business. Um, my first role in United Way of Miami Dade, we raised fifty million dollars to support community initiatives. And that really kind of shined the light for me to, real, to realize it is about, you know, um, playing to the heart, playing to a mission and, and playing to your demographics of who you want to support. But really, this is a business, folks. And, and they have it at, um, you know, churches, synagogues, mosques. They have them within the medical field. They have them really at each and every level that you might be interested in. So Case, um, and I'll send a link here in a second, it's a international body. It's called the Council for Advancement and Success in Education. So their primary focus is higher ed and education overall. And what's kind of wonderful about this, you know, I found a lot of colleagues, a lot of community within this organization, but really they're there to share best practices. Um, it's not like Pepsi and Coke, or maybe even, you know, uh, yeah, don't want to get into high school, but maybe like uh, the Bulls and the Knicks. You know, there's not an antagonism because essentially all of these education, education institutions want to make sure their students are benef benefiting, right, and, and having success both in high school and at a post-secondary level. Um, so I would encourage here with any students who are interested, please feel free to reach out to myself, but also I'll drop a few links because um, Case has money available if you're interested. They have internships available, and it really is a nice way to get, you know, kind of your career started even if you don't plan to be there for a long time, your career started so you can explore this field, um, which I think is just so dynamic and impactful. Um, it, it is not like selling a car. It really is about conveying the mission of, you know, our student athletes, our scholars, and the dreams that they want to catch. I know earlier, uh, A.D., uh, William stated that, you know, it's, it's, it's not too many people, people of color in development fundraising. And one thing me and you discussed, you know, most recently was men of color development. Can you speak about that and the benefits of it? Sure, sure. And I'm dropping a few links within this uh, area now. So maybe to kind of to go 30,000 foot view and then come back down. 
you know, I had originally thought philanthropy, right? Philanthropist meant um, big checks, $10 million, your name on all of these boards. And in truth, what I found over my time in, in uh, kind of fundraising, philanthropy can be as little as $5 or as much as, as you name it. But it's also financial, sure, and, and, and money counts, but it's also your time and your talent. Where are you putting your time and your talent to help others? And in a sense, this men of color and development, but also African-American development officers, I'll share both links, their communities across this nation that really help you know, other fundraisers of color, uh, other fundraisers, of course, in the, in the case of Mossad men, um, by that gender, just to be able to kind of navigate social spaces, predominantly white institutions, or wherever they may Because again, we wanna make sure um, both in fundraising, but more importantly, just for professional success, you have a place to go to. Just like you might um, go to your family or your friends and ask them for help. How do I apply for this? Or, or hey, what's the best outfit I should wear for the date? We wanna make sure at least in AADO and, and Mossad men of color, um, that we have an opportunity to pay it forward by sharing some of our experiences. And oh, by the way, really good opportunity to get into new jobs because hey, we want to work with other qualified and competent professionals who can really know, as, as Jennifer alluded to, know the mission, know the impact, and be able to translate that out. So this is kind of like a, a laid back question. So if you was in college again, you was on this call and you was a college student on this panelist, like, you know, what would you tell yourself knowing which things you know now? Um, you know, I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be radically candid. Right. Um, I would actually kind of tell myself something that one of my mentors, you know, I'm 37, still have mentors, still always learning. But Tim Miner, he uh, had worked in the North Carolina state system for a long time. He always says, Franz, that your network is your net worth. And ultimately that who you know is nearly as key or valuable as what you know. Right. That's a, that's a common phrase that we've said. So I would actually encourage my younger self, um, don't think that opportunity may come to you you know, Franz, Franz in, in high school and or college, go out and knock on people's doors. And I know it may sound nervous, you don't want to talk about either money or need, but I'll tell you a secret, and it's not that secret, people love to talk about themselves. <laughs> so if you give you a one, two, three, you look on LinkedIn or you look online and you find somebody's contact, send them a note. Hey, I'm Franz Williams. I would love to learn more about what you do. I would love to be in your shoes one day. Could I have 15 minutes to buy a cup of coffee or just to host a, a Zoom conversation. Um, and in doing that, quite honestly, that's how I, I'm here in my position today, just by talking to people, being really quick to say, I wanna be where I can you know, be an advocate, impact the opportunity gap, and really help people empower themselves. Um, so you know, go out there, you're student athletes, you get energized and excited, um, and less about you, your dreams, right? What do you wanna do? How do you wanna um, change this world, you know, on a court, on a field, off the court, off the field. Um, where do you come from? All of those things can really set you apart and keep knocking, keep knocking on those doors and asking people, hey, how'd you get there? I'd love to learn more about yourself. Oh, I had the same question for you, Miss A.D. Williams. Like, you know, if you was in college again, you was an undergrad student, you was on this call today. Don't get me wrong, you had a lot of success, but what would you tell yourself? What would you do differently or what advice would you give yourself now? Oh, y'all keep calling me A.D. Williams. Y'all trying to channel me back into the to the college landscape here. No, but I'll take it. But um, um, I would tell my younger self to not take things so seriously. I think as student athletes, we are very focused. We are very driven. Sometimes we put unnecessary pressures on ourselves to be great, to be perfect. And it's okay to have to set goals. I'm really big on goal setting, but don't take yourself so seriously. And, um, you know, know that you're always growing. Um, you know, I'm, 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 I'm older now. And um, I tell myself, I'm always going to be a lifelong learner, like Franz said. And, um, you know, be okay with making mistakes is how you recover from mistakes and what you learn from those mistakes. And then um, I want to tell people, you know, don't let someone tell you you can't do something. I had people tell me that I would not be a fundraiser. I would not be successful because I was a woman of color, that I should go work in compliance or academics. And I knew that wasn't for me, not to knock those who are in 
compliance or academics. That just wasn't my passion, my calling. And you have to be okay and be comfortable knowing what it is that you want to do and not listen to the naysayers, the haters, as the kids call them, because there's a lot of them out there and they're going to try to tear you down. But you have to know what it is that you want to do and go out there and do it Um, because you'll find people like myself, like France, you know, who want to help you. Um, There are others like Katie, like people want to help you. They want to see you succeed. And that's been my biggest thing is paying it forward because I didn't always have people that looked like me who were willing to pay it forward. Um, A lot of my mentors are white men, you know, and who've helped me because that's really all that's in development when I was coming through the pipeline back in 2007, 2008. But now as a woman, a black woman, I want to see more women of color in development. And um, I'm going to drop a link to NCAA and NAD which is your National Association of Athletic Development Directors. I served on the executive committee prior to leaving um, college athletics. Um, They just formed a, um, a, a, a leadership training called the Foundations of Fundraising. And this is more for administrators, but I have a lot of administrators that approach me all the time Um, about how do they get more involved in fundraising, especially those who are looking to be athletic directors, because at the majority of institutions, you have to be able to generate revenue somehow. Um, And you that to me, I tell people all the time, if you can raise money, you're going to always have a job. So I'm going to drop the link in there, um, you know, for our administrators who may be looking to get some additional trainings, but I think it's a wonderful program that the NCAA and that NAD has now combined to do. And then for our student athletes on the call, um, if there, if you want to have more conversations about how you get involved, please let me know. Um, I'm at USA Basketball right now. I'm looking to implement a program where we bring um, a cohort of interns to intern at our uh, governing body with USA Basketball, and I'm hoping to start that off in 20. 20- we're in 2022, 2023, and it's going to be geared mostly toward our HBCUs and our Hispanic serving institutions. So um, I had the opportunity to get out and speak to some um, teams. I spoke to Hampton. I spoke to Norfolk. I spoke to some other of the teams that I um, interacted with while I was on my travels. And um, there was a lot of interest because, again, while you all may have aspirations of going pro, and I pray that you do, you need to have a backup plan because if you go pro, you're not going to be a pro all your life. You're not going to be my age trying to go give somebody a drop step. So you need to be able to have a backup plan and have a plan, a career plan as to what you want to transition into. So um, I'm going to leave my LinkedIn information because I do have a hard stop at 10 because I have to catch a flight to DC. So um, I just want to be a resource to you all and um, any way I can help. Pass the mic back to Tori to ask our student athletes some questions, and we can we, we can mix and match me and Tori. Good. Again, all right. Hello, hello, hello. Once back again. All right. So I am going to be asking our student athletes, a lovely panel of student athletes, some questions just about development and just trying to see do they kind of know what it is, uh, how has it helped them uh, and just some general questions that Kevin and I have. So I am actually going to start it off with Miss Jewel. Uh, hello, Miss Jewel. How are you doing today? I'm good. How are you? I am well. Thank you for asking. So just because uh, I do believe you are at Mississippi Valley State, correct? Yes. Okay. Um, so just kind of kind of walk us through a little bit. Um, I'm not sure if, you know, your institution has received the AASP grant or anything like that, but just mm-hmm. if you have, if you have been in a space where you've been able to, you know, talk to donors or even talk to fans of Mississippi Valley State, like can you kind of walk us through what it feels like to be that student athlete, that advocate in order to bring people into your space to support what you do? So the conversation usually starts as you ask them when they graduated and how much has changed since then. And they sort of get into it. Well, back in my day, we got to do this, we got to do that sort of conversation. So that's always a good icebreaker to compare our um, what is that, our experiences at Mississippi Valley State University, and that sort of creates that bond. And then after that bond is created, that's when we sort of talk about what we need today as athletes, or even sometimes even as students, because the Valley family is very thick, very thick. They're very caring. If we tell our alumni, just recently, one of our alumni, softball alumni, she donated us water bottles, due to COVID. So our own personal water bottles, our masks, and it's always that type of energy. Like 
if we say we need, we're getting fed this weekend as we travel to Louisiana. So it's not the lack of donors, it's just that creating that first initial bond that I think will help us mostly. All right, I appreciate you being so honest about that. And then just to kind of piggyback off, is there ever a time where you don't feel confident enough to speak to um, alumni that you, like, let's say there's an alumnus, alumnus who's like been removed for 50 years. Uh, do you uh, do you kind of feel that there's a, a little bit of a, I guess a wedge or do you not feel comfortable with speaking to them about certain things? No, ma'am, um, I'm comfortable talking to anyone who attended Valley. I feel like there's never like that, oh, I graduated 67, you're here now. Like you were not the same, it's always, you went to Valley, I went to Valley, we're family, period. Like that's where it ends off. And it's actually funny because on game days, specifically football, softball sells brochures to donate or to raise money for our program and the school as well. And so we're selling it to people who graduated in 2017 and we're selling it to people who graduated in 87. And the conversations we have with each individual, you would think we all are at school at the same time. Got to. That sounds that sounds so good, especially just because that even though, you know, there is a generational gap, but just understanding that you all have that commonality of, you know, being from the same institution, getting the same type of learning, being in the same space. Uh, it's 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 definitely I'll say it, it's magical. We'll say, we'll say it like that. Um, but I'll also pass off to Kevin, who's going to ask another panelist, another question. Monty Brown, are you still there? Yes, I'm here. So, Karen, you at Talladega College, and y'all did a lot of buildings around there. You have a new gymnasium, I think it holds 5,000. You actually have the new uh, art museum, which was built for your murals, correct? The historical murals. And you actually yeah. have, you actually also have a new dormitory. Uh, can you see how fundraising and uh, philanthropy plays, plays effect in it and affect you, affect you as a student, like kind of enhance your experience as a student? Um, it affects us a lot. Sorry for the noise uh, okay. when I practice right now. But um, it affects us a lot. Without our donors and our alumni, we wouldn't have been able to upgrade Talladega House. You know, better. Like, before the new gym was built, it was just a dirt field. Now we have a gym where everybody can sit and we can host so many different things and a better opportunity for better dorms because, you know, not every school has, you know, the best dorms. And the fact that we were able to get better dorms for our students, it's amazing to me because I came in in the new era, as we like to call it where I got to get experience all the new things that other people didn't get to. Yes, when I was there, uh, I was actually played in the old gymnasium. So uh, a lot of a lot of talks to your, your your head coach, Kevin Hearn, and a lot of talks to Dr. Billy Hawkins, the president there. He was actually a mastermind when it comes to fundraising. And, you know, as you can see, you know, fundraising is very important. You was able to get the things you have now that most of us weren't able to get. And I'll pass the mic back to Tori. All right, so I'm actually going to reach out to Miss Selena. Uh, if you're present, just kind of you know, show me your face. So, well, hello. Hello. Pleasure to meet you. How are you doing today? I'm good. How are you? No, oh, I am wonderful. Again, thank you for asking. It's a Friday, Junior. What all can we expect? Um, but I just want to, because I am reading your bio right now, and I do see that you are a part of the student, the student athlete advisory committee. Um, if you want to just actually just give me a question. Um, so for that committee, uh, do you hold any kind of uh, executive position or are you just a regular member or can you just kind of explain that for me? Um, yes, so I've served um, as the Student Athlete Advisory Committee president since 2019. Um, and I've held my position up until throughout this year. Um, so I started out as just a regular member in SEC as a freshman. And then I came in on as um, the queen on the board, and then I applied to, <laughs> and then I applied for the um, for the president position, and I've held that position since then. Oh well, she said we have title and status, lovely. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but as being the queen of the student athlete advisory committee, I, being an advisor here at Texas State for that committee as well, I do understand that you are the bridge between student athlete body, uh, academics, or campus, and also the AD of the president so can you and also you know in some spaces you know donors or whenever you have to go talk during football games and things like that so can you just kind of explain how you navigate that space being in a position of representation for the entire you know athletic 
I mean, the student athlete body, but being able to paint a picture that is conducive to their mission, the campus's mission, but also reaching out about what you need. Yeah, so I, Lincoln, like we're really small, we're a really small athletic program. So it's, it's really nice for us, I guess you could say. Um, so I have a really great relationship with our athletic director. I have a great relationship with our school president, um, all the coaches, all the athletes. It, it was hard in the beginning um, because, you know, you have a lot of not backlash, but athletes who don't really want to communicate with their coaches, what they need, what they want. And so we were able to establish like a safe space. So we get representatives from each team to come tell us like their concerns from their teammates. And then I sit in the faculty meetings once a month and I voice all of the concerns for the athletes. I don't list out what team said what, who said what to what coach, whatever the case is. And the coaches, they really love it because it's time, it's a time for them to really sit down, decompress and really realize like, okay, well, I think I'm doing X, Y, and Z, but really I'm only doing A and B. Like, and so it, they love it. Like, they're like, thank you for the feedback. Um, they write it down. We have um, right now mental health is really big on our agenda because we just this is our first this is our first full year back from COVID. So we have a lot of new faces and not a lot of new athletes and not a lot of new coaches that everybody pretty much doesn't know. So it is a it, we are in a state right now where a lot of student athletes are uncomfortable going to their coaches and talking to them. So they know that, OK, well, I'm going to say this to my captains. My captains are going to take it to our representatives and our representatives are going to take it to the SAC board. The board, I know for a fact, is going to make sure that our coaches know how I feel know what I need know what I want and the coaches are going to talk about it and they're going to do their absolutely best to sit there and try and work through whatever kinks they have on their teams um so it's been it's been really good um communication has been our biggest thing I'm very big on I'll send the email and then I'll pop in your office and I'll be like hey I sent an email to you did you get it I know you saw it so and then so we're really good at communicating um just being, I guess, more so open to understanding that we are all human. And even though they are our coaches, they do make mistakes as well. So they've gone through life, but they've also made mistakes. So, okay, you're not doing so well in a class, but you know that if I go to my coach, my coach might be mad, but really your coach will sit down. Hey, look, I was a student athlete at one point in time. This class was hard for me to get through. And like, you got it. Look, this is what we're going to do. We have great tutors. We have study hall hours that we implement that everybody just willingly goes to. So it's like, it, it took a while, but in order for us to get there, like, we had to start changing the culture of Lincoln. We had to start changing the culture in our athletic department. And the last, since we've had our AD, our AD came in with me in 2017. And ever since uh, Mr. Stinson's been here, like, he's just been changing the culture of Lincoln. And we're really just one big happy family. Well, thank you for, you know, blessing us with those little nuggets and just making, making it aware that, you know, at the end of the day, the student athletes are the people that we serve. They are the community that we serve. And so that you all actually have a voice and a stance that you can stand on and that, you know, talking to administration, it's not just this big, scary thing that it's something that definitely needs to happen uh, because how can we as administrators or how can we as a campus or how can we as an industry move forward if we're not necessarily hearing and seeing or, you know, even taking in the information of what the actual like community that we serve, what they need. So I do appreciate you being open and honest about that. And then I'll My pleasure. Oh, you're welcome. Right. Go ahead and I'm gonna go ahead and pass it off to Kevin. What's happening? Are you, you still there? Um, try her again, Kevin. I don't yeah. I don't think she heard you all the way. Mr. Mr. Todd, can you hear me? I'm so sorry. I didn't hear my name called. No, 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 no. That's so okay. No, no apologies. I'm really going to put you on the spot right now because I, I know right now that you are getting your master's in uh, athletic administration, correct? Yes. So I know I know when I was in grad school, you know, I was searching for internships and it took me a while to get one. So if uh, A.D. Williams or Mr. Franz Williams offer you an internship in development fundraising, would you take it and why would you take it? Um, I would never say no. Um, I am open to trying everything. Um, I actually met with uh, the Deputy Commission of Durham Sports um, yesterday, and we were talking about internships, and some advice that she gave me was 
Um, never say no, always try everything because by doing that, you'll find out what you do, what you don't like and what you do like, and that will kind of help you lead down the right path. So I would 100% say yes, um, even if it was something that I might not think is going to be long term, I think it would give me some amazing skills. Um, it would teach me a lot about communicating with different types of people from all over the place. Um, so it would give me a really good insight, especially in is it such a big part of college athletics and that's the career I want to go into. So, yeah. So you, so you say you do want to go into college athletics, correct? Sorry, say that again? You say you do want to go into college athletics, correct? Yes, definitely. Yeah. One, thing I, one thing I learned about college athletics is fundraising and philanthropy is it always going to tie in every, every department you in, especially when the, the higher that you want to move up. Yeah. 100%. That's all, that's all the questions I have. If, if the student athletes have any questions for our, our expert speakers, uh, please ask away. Um, I had one question. It's sort of a little off topic, um, depending on how you feel. When, at what age, did you realize, okay, this is something like I could see myself going on? I know Mr. Um, what was it? William said he was uh, probably in college, a little after college, but how about for the other panelists? I think Ms. Yeah, I think Ms. Jennifer has a flight to leave and Ms. Ms. York had a 12 o'clock meeting with the NCAA. Uh, but she can, we, we can reach out to him later, but you can direct your question towards Ms. Franz Williams to answer for you also. Yeah, yeah, um, just to give you a, a little sense, right, my, where I started did not go in a straight line. It looks more like, you know, squiggles. Um, so essentially just to give you kind of right hard dates, I was 22, 23, graduated college, um, one of my first roles, professional roles, was working for United Way. I stepped back. I did that for two years, and I stepped back, and I worked in the private sector for Delta Airlines. I did a little bit of marketing. Um, it was only, you know, eight years later that I kind of woke up and I said, you know, it's not – I needed something with more purpose. You know, I needed something that would make my heart go wild, and I would know that every time I go to bed, I'm doing some good work. So I, I got back into nonprofit um, kind of as, as um, uh, I think Natasha had said, right? Just try a bunch of things, see if it's for you. Um, timing's everything. So, hey, at, at my mid-20s, it wasn't the right time. But I realized, you know, I look young, but, but here in my, my upper 30s, I realized sort of at the 30, I needed something that I was going to be really excited about day in, day out, and I jumped back into it. And uh, I'll just add to, um, I'm a big proponent, go talk to everyone, build your network up, because they can help, you know, it may not be the first conversation, but they can help you kind of visualize, well, how do I move into that space? Or once I'm there, what's my next move to get in or out or advance my career? Um, so I definitely encourage you to, to reach out to me, the other panelists, um, to help, help you individually. Thank you. Any other questions? Uh, if not, I just want to appreciate everybody coming and I'm very apologetic about the technology difficulties earlier, uh, but we, we seem to work it out and answer the question that they been, need to be answered. And if you have any questions or concerns, uh, I believe all the experts, uh, speakers left the information in the chat box. And once again, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Kevin, Ms. Tori, and all the student athletes. And I'll leave my thank you my so much. Here. Thank you. <laughs>